booktube it's angie if you've been hanging around the the channel this channel for a little bit you may have noticed uh over the course of the months i've been building up some playlists on the channel for different topics but <laughs> i started those playlists with the best intentions and then you know got caught up in life and i've just been noticing that i need to start feeding those playlists because a lot of them only have like one or two videos on them even though i have books sitting over here that are all read and tagged with certain sections for different videos I have in mind. Over the course of the next few days, uh, weeks or so, uh, I'm hoping to get to all those books that have been sitting there waiting for their topics to be talked about and to start filling those playlists for you guys. One of the playlists that a lot of those books involve is the snippets, linking on what I named that playlist but it's basically like the excerpts the readings from different books there's no real method to which books end up on that playlist it's pretty much just whenever I come across uh, a certain section in a book that I think you guys might get a kick out of of that particular excerpt then I'll I'll do a feature video from that book could be nonfiction could be fiction who knows <laughs> I'm just picking them as I go so this video is for one of those uh, snippets videos and the section I'm going to be reading out of today is from Drop Dead Healthy by AJ Jacobs and if you missed when I talked about his books before uh, the gist of what he does is he's a nonfiction writer who basically does um, experimental journalism where he goes out and he he wants to learn about something so he gives himself a project for anywhere from a few months to usually like a year or so and he completely immerses himself in the topic and then goes and writes a book about it the first book of his i read was uh the year of living biblically it's not <laughs> i mean it has to do with the bible but it's not really a religious book it's more about him looking at um you know when you have people that say that they live their lives by the book of the bible the word for word um he looked at how feasible that actually would be if you took the bible literally as it says in you know certain biblical commandments word for word about the things about you know wearing certain clothes or um not eating certain things or eating certain things or you know certain practices that are set word for word in the bible if you went by the literal translation of that um, how difficult would that be to pull off in today's world so he does that for i think it was about a year he did it he um just immersed himself in that project read all of these religious texts um or clothing that was only <laughs> publicly approved um tried to eat as much food that would have been of the period that kind of thing um so that was one book he did and then he did one called uh the know-it-all i think where he read an entire encyclopedia set from a to z and then wrote about it this one he looks at um basically rebuilding or improving his body from the ground up and each section in this book has to do with a certain part of his body so the part i was going to read from has to do with uh, I'm not going to read the entire chapter, just a part of it, um, but it has to do with how uh, human beings tolerate pain, how we process pain, the lengths we go to to try to get rid of pain. Um, that's the, the theme of this particular chapter that I'm going to read from. He talks about one of the things that prompts him on this month's quest to look at improving uh, pain management and that sort of thing is he actually ends up injuring his shoulder while doing this project so he has to go to these different specialists and look at what he can do about his shoulder pain my shoulder injury has prompted me to to devote this month to researching and ridding myself of pain the first lesson thank god i was born in an age of painkillers the majority of americans are accustomed to living relatively pain-free lives most of the time the situation hasn't always been the case for most of human history. Pain has been our long, constant, horrible companion. Just contemplate the awful spectacle of surgery without anesthesia. 
If you read the absorbing book, The Pain Chronicles by Melanie Thernstrom, you learned that the doctors refused to tell their patients what day surgery was scheduled for. They'd simply just show up at the patient's house a random Tuesday or Thursday for a surprise operation. Otherwise, the patients would commit suicide the night before. It was that bad. Thernstrom quotes Fanny Burney, a British novelist who, uh, who had a mastectomy in 1810, performed, incidentally, by Napoleon's chief surgeon. Bernie gave us the most vivid surviving description of pre-drug surgery. You might need anesthesia to read this. And then it goes into Bernie's words. It was a terror that surpassed all description. This is Bernie having her mastectomy. When the dreadful steel was plunged into the breast, cutting through veins, arteries, flesh, nerves, I began a scream that lasted unintermittently during the whole time of the incision, and I almost marvel that it rings not in my ears still. It's a hard phrase to say in <laughs> old time English. When the wound was made and the instrument was drawn, the pain seemed undiminished, for the air that had suddenly rushed into those delicate parts felt like a mass of minute but sharp poniards. When again I felt the instrument describing a curve cutting against the grain while the flesh resisted in a manner so forcible as to oppose entire the hand, then indeed I thought I must have expired. Fanny Bernie going through a mastectomy without anesthesia. <laughs> and then it goes back into A.J. Jacobs' words. Even after anesthesia was invented, it wasn't always used. Suffering, you see, was natural. When I wrote my book on the Bible, I read about the bizarre 19th century controversy over women giving birth under, under anesthesia. Some felt it violated God's commandment, women will give birth in pain. Nowadays, pain has receded from our lives a bit, but we have a long way to go. Chronic pain, meaning pain that lasts several months, afflicts 70 million Americans at a cost of $100 billion to the economy, according to a study by the National Institute of Health Pain Research Consortium. We haven't yet found a suitable treatment for chronic pain. Pills sometimes work, but they tend to be addictive. Reading about pain, I'm reminded once again that I want a refund on this body. Everyone should get one. Send this fleshy bag of bones and muscle back to the factory. I'm not saying that the body isn't amazing in many ways. It is. I could marvel for days at the design of the ear and how it converts puffs of air into a Hayden concert. But at the same time, the body has deeply embedded bugs. We're the result of ad hoc evolution and outdated hardware. And pain is one of the cruelest, most primal systems. Pain is so unsubtle. Couldn't evolution have found a better way to alert us that we'd stubbed our toe? Rather than this sensation that makes us curse the day our mom and dad met at the college cafeteria, what about just having the to toe throb gently? Or turn green? Or play a little ragtime number? I'd pay attention, I swear. Pain is annoying and unnecessary, like getting an email in all caps. It's like the six-year-old who alerts you every 15 seconds that he wants the Hungry Hungry Hippos game for his birthday. Yes, I understand. Message received. Maybe when we were slugs, we needed pain's brutish alarm system to pay attention. But now that we have cerebral cortices, pain should have been phased out. Not to mention that pain is ridiculously unreliable. Thernstrom describes this problem with a wonderful metaphor. Think of pain as a guard in a watchtower. He rings the bell when he sees enemies. Problem is, the guard is erratic, lazy, easily confused, fearful, a poor multitasker, and sometimes just deluded. Sometimes he'll ring the bell for no reason. Sometimes he'll keep ringing the bell long after the enemies have been killed. Pain can erupt with no cause, linger for years, even appear in a phantom limb. And here's one of pain's most sadistic qualities. If you suffer from chronic pain, it often doesn't ebb as the body heals. It just gets worse. Pain begets pain. The neural pathways become smoother, the message stronger. It's a positive feedback loop that serves only to increase our misery. My shoulder pain has gotten bad enough that I'll try anything to cure it. My general practitioner taught me some physical therapy exercises, which I do at home, using a pole as a very light barbell. No improvement so far. Julie gives me a massage every night as she reads her historic novels, which helps some. I've tried a makeshift Buddhist approach. Instead of fleeing from the pain, I concentrate on it with a zen, non-partisan mindset. I say to myself, now that's an interesting sensation. The burning, the throbbing, I overthink the pain. But this strategy works better with short-term pain, a thumb jammed in a drawer, for instance, than it does with my lingering shoulder ache. 
So today I'm trying a new strategy, acupuncture. I find a place a block away in New York, an acupuncturist is never more than a five minute walk from your house. And now I'm in the waiting room in the basement of a building. The door to the waiting room is propped open with a watermelon sized Buddha. I'm getting a whiff of that unmistakable Alterna health scent. I can't quite pinpoint it. Is it jasmine, frankincense, spilled kale juice? But I always smell it at non-Western medical practices. I fill out my forms and browse the pamphlets, which are clearly targeted at another gender. Example, a gluten-free tonic called Xenopause. The acupuncturist calls me into her office. She introduces herself as Galena. She's a solid Russian woman in her 60s with bangs, a thick accent, and a white robe covered with words such as calm and relax in both English and Chinese. So what brings you here, she asks. I explain about the pain in my shoulder. She nods, jots down a note, and then she asks me questions for 10 minutes straight, scribbling more notes. Do you sweat? Yes. Which places? Armpits and face? I look around the office. It's dark, more like a Viennese cafe than an ice squintingly fluorescent western doctor's office. Asian fans and anatomy posters cover the walls. After quizzing me about my sleep and bathroom and eating habits, Galena gets up from her chair. You ready? I'm ready, except for the head. I don't want anything in the head. Well, I'm doing the head. Apparently, the customer is always right philosophy wasn't taught in Galena's native Russia. I groan. I have some long-standing neuroses about anything touching my head, much less piercing my skull. I'm irrationally afraid of brain damage. When I was a kid, it was even worse. The skull was off limits. No friendly pats on the head, no soccer with its insane practice of bonking the ball with your pate. And if grandma came in for a kiss on the forehead, I would dart my head like Manny Pacquiao. Nowadays, I let Julie tousle, tousle my hair, but still careful. The head actually has the least nerve endings, Galena assures me, so it'll be the least painful. I give a weak smile. One in a hundred people pass out. Maybe not even that. Usually it's the big guys, she laughs. She leads me to another chair in the center of the room. Which is more sensitive? One, two, three, or four? She presses her fingers down hard on different areas near my bald spot. Three, I say. You know, acupuncture probably started in Russia, she said as she rubs alcohol-soaked cotton on my head. The first corpse that had markings of acupuncture was found in Siberia. It was mummified. I'm not going to argue with a woman who is about to insert sharp objects into my ex exposed skull. She takes out a matchstick needle and pulls off its blue plastic cap. When I f Then I feel the prick, then a slide, and there's a faint but distinct sound of the needle gliding through the various layers of skin. It's not too painful, about twice as bad as a mosquito bite, but the sound makes my stomach turn. You can look in the mirror if you want, she said. I get up and walk across the room. There it is, sticking out of my head like a tiny antenna. And then she presses my skull again. Galena gives me a crash course in acupuncture theory. It's about energy pathways. They're like roads in the body, and the energy can build up behind one part and cause the other parts not to have enough energy. The acupuncture is like a tow truck that clears up the traffic jam. The chi, or the energy, can flow smoothly through the body's channels or meridians. The channels are linked to different parts of the body. Today she's working on the lung channel, which is linked to my shoulder. Galena slides another needle into my head and one into my left leg. She flicks the needle in my leg. It boings like a cartoon arrow going into a target. After my acupuncture session, I head straight to the gym for a workout with Tony. How many needles did she put in, Tony asks. Three, I said. Three, he laughs. You got ripped off, my friend. On a per needle basis, you got ripped off big time. Tony tells me his acupuncturist puts in 40 needles minimum, even when he does acupuncture on dogs, which is his sideline business. That's annoying. I didn't even get as many needles as your average Scottish terrier. Did Galena not think I was virile enough to take more than three needles? could have at least hit double digits. But here's the weird thing. Even though I was poked only three times, I noticed something. My shoulder feels better. Not totally better, but a lot better. For the first time in months, I can raise my arm in the air without a twinge. For the first time in months, I can do shoulder presses with dumbbells bigger than hot dogs. This is amazing, I said. The voodoo worked. It really worked. So what happened? To figure this out, here's a quick summary of science's view on acupuncture. 
studies are a frustrating mix. Some show it works, while just as many others show it doesn't. The studies display cultural bias as well. Chinese studies generally come out more pro-acupuncture than American ones. A couple of recent studies show that acupuncture works better than doing nothing. But then so does sham acupuncture, which consists of just inserting needles in random places around the body. So here are four possibilities of what happened today. One, Chinese medicine is correct and the needles restored my energy balance along my meridians and I'm too entrenched in Western thought to agree with number one. Number two, the body does have pressure points that respond to needles, but science hasn't found the mechanism that makes them reduce pain. Number three, sticky needles in almost any part of the body, not including the eyes, relieves pain, perhaps by causing a surge in opioids. Or four, it's all just a placebo effect. My guess, and it's only a guess, a combination of three and four. And by number four, I don't mean to be dismissive. And then he goes on to talk about the power of the placebo effect in humans. Um, so I just thought I would share that. I thought that was a pretty interesting section. And that's it for this video. I just wanted to share that little snippet, maybe get you interested in some of AJ Jacobs' works. And yeah, that's it. Um, so yeah, we'll see you in the next video. Hopefully you like these and you'll come on back. Thanks for watching guys.